Good evening, and thank you all for joining me tonight. My name is Allison Glenn, and I am the guest curator of Promise Witness Remembrance, which is on view currently at the Speed Art Museum. When I was invited to um, have the opportunity to think about this exhibition in Louisville, I spent a lot of time reading and rereading news and um, media coverage over the past year in Louisville. And one story that really resonated very strongly with me was this story of Tyler Girth. And I am lucky to be joined here tonight with some people who care about him greatly. So the first person I'm introducing is John P. Cherry. He's a widely published multi-specialty photographer whose work spans a wide range of photographic disciplines. Currently, John is committed to documenting the community uprising, the COVID-19 pandemic, and cultural occurrences in Louisville, Kentucky. Tiffany Hensley is Tyler Girth's older sister and vice president of Building Equal Bridges, the Tyler Girth Foundation. Born and raised in Louisville, alumna of Assumption High School, she currently resides in Lexington, Kentucky. Tiffany is the wife of Byron Hensley and the mother to Mason, Brantley, and Cohen. Brittany Lowen is Tyler Girth's eldest sister and president of Building Equal Bridges, the Tyler Girth Foundation. A proud Louisville native and graduate of St. Raphael and Assumption High School, she now resides in Indianapolis, Indiana with her husband, Joshua, and four young children. Building Equal Bridges, the Tyler Girth Foundation, exists to carry on the name and legacy of Tyler Girth. Fueled by our core values of unification, education, and collaboration, we seek to create a more equitable world for the next generation paved by those driven and determined to make it so. I'll turn it over to Brittany and Tiffany. Thank you, Allison. Um, and before we get started, we wanted to take a moment just to recognize and honor Tyler. Um, for those of you um, of faith, we'd love to just take a moment in silent prayer um, for your thoughts, uh, your prayers, um, and just your energy. Um, we are so honored to be here tonight, um, but we recognize that we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be connected in this way if it weren't for um, just the absolute tragic loss of our baby brother. And so we wanted to take uh, a brief moment to remember him, uh, to remember who he is and what he stood for um, and why this movement was so important to him. So we'll take just a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. And Tiffany, I'm gonna start with you. Can you talk to us a bit about how you all came to work together? Yeah, so um, John actually reached out to us shortly after Tyler was killed. Um, I think it was two days after actually. Um, and he offered his services to anything that he could do, um, you know, photography wise. He, he even mentioned that um, a bunch of his photography friends had, you know, said that anything that they can do to help support us in moving forward so that we can honor Tyler and rem remember him, um, he would be more than willing and happy to do so. Um, so through his generosity, we actually took him up on it. We met him, um, I would say a few weeks later at a march, um, and we walked up to him and we were like, hey, John. Um, and so we started talking to him about um, working with us and helping us navigate through the foundation and um, just how we were new to all of this and we didn't know where we needed to go or who we needed to talk to. Um, and he graciously led us through that path. Um, he actually sat down with me and my mom um, one day and we went over Tyler's images and it was instant that we had a friendship with him. Um, the way that he was just so kind and um, honoring Tyler and how he um, acknowledged that this was a hard time for us and that he just held space um, for us throughout that moment. Um, we were able to share some pretty emotional and personal things about Tyler with him. And I mean, he, he instantly had a friendship, I feel like with Tyler, um, the way that he spoke about him and uh, the way that he looked at his photography and just had a connection with him in that sense. Um, and so I think from there, we just, we clicked and we've been friends since then. 
Yeah, yeah, to, um, to kind of support and back up some of the things that you said, Tiffany, um, that, that night at the square was one that I had left early to go home. I had been out all day and it was a hot day and I just wanted to go home and get some rest. And whenever I found out that a photographer had been killed at the square, it, it affected me and, and hurt me in a way that, um, you know, it, it was something that I thought could eventually happen to, to me. It was something that I was afraid of, you know, leading up to that point without knowing any of the specifics of what happened to Tyler. Um, and also realizing that he was in a very specific role as a photographer, as an observer, as someone who was creating an anthology of moments in his own life. So moving past that day, when I reached out to you all, it was after I had had a lot of long discussions with some of my colleagues, uh, Xavier Burrell and Eric Branch, about what would happen if this was one of us, what would we do? And, that, and then it opened that discussion. What, if something happened to one of us, I want, Xavier, I want you to take my last photos and I want you to edit them down and I want you to present them in a tasteful way that my friends and family can enjoy. And so that was the original approach was coming to you all and saying that I understand that you're going through a really tough time. I can't even imagine what this is like. Whenever you're ready, I and my, my colleagues would like to help with some of those last images because that is his legacy. As a, some of his last thoughts that are sitting on that, um, that SD card on the camera. And it was, it was interesting going through his photos whenever we finally, when we finally sat down together to look through them, when you gave me access to, you know, the Google Drive, when we were talking about the photos and all the Zoom calls, we've had so many Zoom, Zoom meetings. I don't even know how many Zoom meetings we've all had together. Um, and they've been lovely, every single one. And emotional, of course. Uh, but when we were going through all of these, I, I, I feel um, particularly connected to the man when interestingly enough, Tyler and I never met a lot of people don't. I, I think a lot of people really need to understand that. Uh, first and foremost, Tyler and I never met. We never spoke. I barely remember ever seeing him. Um, he's not even really depicted in any of my photos, and I'm not in any of his photos. Uh, maybe one, maybe two, but there are so many instances where some of his best photos are side by side, right next to some of my best photos, indicating that we were standing right on top of each other or right next to each other. Uh, so we got so close, but we never got so close. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting analyzing his work, talking about his work with you all and my own time going through it and imagining, you know, what was, what were his thoughts? What were some of his habits? Why did he get close to this? Why did he choose to depict this situation in, in one way, a situation that I was in? Why was it so different than how I, how I chose to go about it? Um, that eventually I found friendship as you mentioned earlier, found friendship posthumously to a man who I never met, whose work I know very intimately. And it almost seems serendipitous in a way that we never, we never met, we never got close. So I never got to experience the loss of him until I got to know you two um, and experience that loss with, with you all. Uh, of course, not to the degree that you do because you have much more intimate memories of him. Um, and he gave a lot more to you all specifically because you spent, you spent so much time together. Um, but it's really, it's, uh, it's put me in a very unique position, you know, helping and consulting with you all in certain things, but then also getting to know someone in such a unique way, um, almost like reading a book about his life, um, that he wrote that nobody else gets to see. Um, and he seems like he was somebody I would have really liked to have meet, liked to have met that I never got to meet, but I really admire his work. And it's not just protest work too, that we've reviewed together. It's some of his wildlife, some of his landscape, his travels, the, the story of his manhood of his adulthood is very similar to mine is just as probably just as tumultuous. It was just as difficult. I mean, I think that, you know, a, a man in his twenties is probably one of the most, you know, volatile and, <laughs> and complicated and, and depressed figures and just trying to figure it out. And um, I think there was something to him creating his life's work in that summer um, mm -hmm. that I've been just very dis distinctly and, and deeply honored to, to be a part of that, that journey with you all and uh, uh, have my own personal journey through, 
through that as well. Thanks, so thank you. Oh, no, thank you, John. The gift that you have given us in processing Tyler's portfolio has been incredible because you, as you mentioned, have lived some of the same experiences and um, stood shoulder to shoulder with him during some of those moments. And so to hear what he likely was thinking and to get a sense of um, creatively what you see when you look at his photos has been so healing and um, truly life-giving and um, it, it helps us to see the purpose in what Tyler did and um, the gift that it is to have his portfolio of images and uh, to couple that with the perspective from you um, has just been, like I said, the ultimate gift in understanding um, his, his life as a whole, but in particular, those last few weeks um, and, and what he was experiencing. So we are so grateful for that. Um, as part of this conversation and, and the, the journey that we're walking through, we thought we would introduce all of you who are joining us here uh, to Tyler in a little bit more deeper and intimate fashion. And so, um, Karen, if you want to share the slides. Um, so we started with a, an image of, um, this is one of uh, the images that Tyler took of the bridges. Uh, the bridges were one of the, Tyler's favorite things to photograph. And so when we were um, establishing the foundation to honor and to carry on Tyler's work and what he was so passionate about, um, we knew that uh, we wanted to, to depict something where, um, where we could find common ground. Uh, we truly believe that uh, Tyler has viewed uh, the events of the last year as so much more um, than a, a political football, um, that it is a human rights issue that needs to be dealt with and addressed. Um, and, and that it needs to be something that we can all find common ground on and that, um, that, that any uh, person with any amount of decency um, can see that there is work to be done. And so that is where, um, that's truly where the foundation began uh, was in this idea of building bridges and finding common ground. And, and so we started with this photo of, of the bridges um, that Tyler was so fond of. And so if you move to the next slide again, I uh, wanted to give you just a bit more of an intimate look into who uh, Tyler is. And so this was taken uh, when Tyler went on a bit of a sabbatical, a bit of a journey, a pilgrimage of self-discovery in the spring of 2020. Um, it was uh, ironic or serendipitous, whatever you want to call it, that this trip was planned uh, before COVID. And so he continued to go and he it was him and his dog that traveled out west in his truck um, and spent weeks out uh, by himself photographing and really taking a look introspectively at who he was and his purpose here in this life. Um, and he came away with such a strong sense of who he was and what he wanted to accomplish and where his values lied um, and ultimately the purpose that he believed God had for him. And um, we're just so thankful for that because we know that that anchored him uh, and anchored his decisions. and. Um, we have extreme confidence that he was doing exactly what he knew he should be doing in those moments. Um, and so I'll, I'll read this um, bit of a bio for you again, just to give you a, a bit of a glimpse into the man that Tyler is. So Tyler Girth was a beloved son, cherished little brother, adored uncle, and a trusted friend. Tyler loved watching movies, listening to his vast and diverse record collection, traveling and exploring new places, learning about history through both genealogy research as well as biographies and documentaries. He loved playing and watching a variety of sports, spending time with family and friends, and perhaps, mo perhaps most of all, his beloved companion and rescue dog, Jordan. We are devastated that his life was taken from us far too soon. Tyler was incredibly kind, warm-hearted and generous, holding deep convictions and faith. It was this sense of justice that drove Tyler to be a part of the peaceful demonstrations advocating for the destruction of the systemic racism within our society systems. This combined with his passion for photography led to a strong need within him to be there, documenting the movement, capturing and communicating the messages of peace and justice. And while we cannot fathom this life without our happy, curious, hardworking, funny, precious Tyler, 
We pray that his death would be a turning point and a catalyst for peace in the city that he loved so very much. Thank you, Brittany. And I, I would be remiss to not um, center the reason why Tyler was at the protests and why there were protests. And I wonder if one of you want to speak to the larger conversation here, um, which is the protests, as I understand it, because I was not there, were um, uh, asking, seeking for justice for the killing of Breonna Taylor. Yeah, um, so originally he went out um, on May 29th. Um, that was the first day that he went out. Um, and he was nervous, but um, also seeking the justice that needed to be had. Um, he, after having George Floyd murdered and then Breonna Taylor hearing the news about her, he just, he felt it in him that he needed to be out there. Um, and I think as time went along, um, he saw, you know, what was really wrong in the systems that we have and this, the racism that occurs and police brutality that is still occurring. Um, and I think that that struck something within him, um, both personally and for society. Um, my children are brown um, and he would constantly call me and text me and say, um, you know, Tiffany, I just, I really think that this is something that our, your children cannot grow up in. We have to fight so that um, this doesn't happen to them. Um, and so I think passionately he was, he was really involved um, for personal and both for, for everyone else that, that had to suffer from, you know, racism and, and police brutality in this life. Um, and so he, he really had a passion for it to be out there. Thank you. So John, obviously you've spent a lot of time with Tyler's archive. Can you tell us a bit more about your relationship to the work? So seeing Tyler's work um, was, was something that was intense like just about several months until um, you know, his, his family allowed me access to it. We started working together to review some of these photos and see what could be useful, not just for tell, the telling of his story and the telling of his legacy, but also for uh, building equal bridges and how those images could be used to um, bolster that nonprofit and its mission. Um, and so in, in delving into these images, there were a lot of things about Tyler that I learned that we all learned all just through our inference of him, you know, his sisters talked about how kind of timid or shy that he was, which was something that you could see in the way that he captured photos from, you know, from the beginning, which were a little bit farther away. They were, they were there. You could tell they were taken by a standing timid, um, maybe somebody who's not wanting to get into the action. Uh, photographer, but as days went on, as as the um, hours went on, and some of these days, he would creep closer and closer and closer to the action, and that's where a lot of those really amazing shots that we'll see later on come from. It was that that comfortability that comes with knowing that the best shots are usually taken close. Uh, so just imagining the the brain of someone who's like learning as they go, and I, you know, at the same time, I was also learning as I went and was learning a lot of these same lessons. And, I, and we were on a very similar trajectory um, throughout the process. And that was something you could tell just by, if you set our work side by side, you could make the same, you can make the same conclusions. Um, and then also the content that of which he, he captured. Um, you know, I was there for a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, crowd dispersal measures, the, uh, you know, chemical, um, chemical crowd dispersal measures and, the uh, some of the anger and the sadness and the majority of what Tyler captured was the happy stuff. It was the joy. It was the it was the mundane. It was he. It seemed like he was not there to uh, to take in any of that bad energy, um, which also leaves me with a little bit of survivor for survivor's guilt because I look at all the times that I threw myself into into harm's way and came out mostly unscathed. And look at somebody who was concentrating on the joy like Tyler was and it seems like that's probably more in line with his what his lifestyle is um, and for him to be struck down in that way it's it's I mean as as this whole process has gone along and in the war that I make uh, I, the more I take his work very personally I can't help but feel 
that way that someone like me has been allowed to continue with the work that I do while someone like Tyler was not. Hmm. Maybe yeah, John. It's a good time. Oh, I'm sorry, Tiffany. I was no, you're fine. It's a good time to circle through the images and you all can talk about some of the work. Yeah, I was going to say, I think uh, some of your comments there, John, about his early work is uh, exemplified here early in the in the slides that we've put together. Um, so you'll notice um, uh, both this one and uh, we can camp out here for a moment and then the one ahead, um, both are uh, kind of bystander, right? There, there's some of the incredible signage and the graphical impact of what was happening. Um, but as you mentioned, um, still still a bit removed, um, a bit of space between him and, and what he was photographing. Yeah, absolutely. There's that, that space, some of the aftermath, some of the environmental scene setters, you know, things like that. Of course, it has this greedy black and white, um, this look to it. And it's show, really showing that iconography that if you're somebody who saw what was happening in Louisville on the news that you can tell exactly where, where these, where these things were happening. Um, and I appreciated that. It's, it's the scene setting oftentimes is something that people look over uh, or oh, I'm sorry, overlook whenever they're trying to tell a visual story. Yeah. I think the iconography is, is really powerful. He also, um, he, in the next, um, Slide, I think he captured um, some additional signage, right? And, and just kind of really captured the moment. If you want to flip ahead, um, Allison, I know this, this one was a favorite of yours um, because I think it captured basically both the moment that, that we were in and, and the importance of the protesting. And um, it also, for us, it was special because it captured um, some young people. And as Tiffany mentioned, Tyler's personal drive of being there was very much around uh, his nieces and nephews, and um, just making a change for the next generation. And you can see that in his work as well, um, just this centering around hope and the future and what could be um, if, if we can work together to, to truly make changes and, and to, um, to live out what some of these images are, are protesting. I'll jump in. This was definitely the image on the right with the two young girls holding the sign. I felt like it was such a strong image um, because these young women feel to me, they look so confident. They couldn't be more than maybe 10, if 10, you know, um, but they were in this, what, what this speaks to me of a level of confidence, but also joy. Um, and then the way that he captured the hall of justice behind them. I thought was was remarkable, um, and it it signified promise to me, which hearing now about the way that um, Tyler approached documenting the protests makes complete sense. Yep, absolutely. If you want to move to the next one, I think it kind of starts to showcase how um, both the movement and Tyler's involvement started to evolve. Um, we chose to share this one, um, one, just because of how striking and, and beautiful uh, the photo is with the, the clear blue sky, um, and then just the amount of people that were gathered. Um, you can see there, I mean, dozens, if not hundreds of people gathered. Um, and all there together, right? To stand in unity for um, for this outcry. Um, so John, I don't know if you had any comments here on this one to share. Yeah, I, I always appreciate photos of our uh, beautiful Metro Hall. And you see in a lot of my photos from the square that that's like always a centerpiece. So this was this photo always spoke to me because of my own like personal preference mm -hmm. over it. But you can tell that everyone is all looking in the same direction. Uh, you, you can imagine that it's sweltering hot. I mean, it just looks, the way that he captured it, you can tell that it's it's a very hot day. And I, I really enjoy the color of all of it and how much information you can pull from just understanding the situation of this day, looking at it. It's all a bunch of masked up people, which is really a sign of the times. Uh, I think almost everyone in this crowd is wearing a mask too, which, you know, go us. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you see people that are standing there that some of them have flowers, some of them are holding like their signs up, some of them are holding their signs down. They're all 
posturing and getting ready. But also, if you look very, in, very much in the center of the of the square um, where those people are standing, you can kind of tell that this was before June fifteenth when um, Jefferson Square Park was dubbed Breonna Taylor Square and that occupation started. Uh, there is no memorial that's there yet. Um, we're just heating up, really. Thing, uh, things were just heating up for the, for the summer. There were you know, several violent days at the beginning of, or at the end of May and the beginning of June. Uh, but June 15th was really the day that kind of changed everything downtown as far as this movement is concerned. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just a great photo. Mm. Uh, the next photo was also one that captured, I think, just the size and the energy. Um, and John, I know this was a special day. Um, for you and you vividly capture just kind of the energy that was that was there on that day. Um, and this was um, one that we featured uh, at the Speed exhibit. And so we wanted to showcase it here as well um, because we, we felt like it was really important to showcase um, again, the energy and the excitement and the anticipation of passing Brianna's law. Yeah, and what a day that was, I mean, Ter terribly hot, but we we're, I think, used to it by now. This was probably the 10th, 10th, 15th day of, of protest. Um, I don't remember the date exactly. Um, but there were performers that sang and spoke. Katura Heron with uh, ACLU of Kentucky presented. Uh, her partner, Hannah Drake, presented. Um, and we watched live on Metro TV of, of Metro Council passing this no knock warrant ban. And this was after, you know, so much, um, so much uh, just persuasion, like legislative persuasion throughout the city. And you see that almost every sign there has something to do with uh, no knocks uh, and, and, and anti no knock um, warrant um, uh, speak. And uh, yeah, Tyler and I, you know, we, we might as well have just one of us showed up for this because we have almost all the same shots. And so all of the coverage is completely duplicated. We were standing next to each other the entire time um, it, and still never, never ran into each other. And it's, in fact, there's one photo I was showing Brittany and, and Tiffany the other day whenever we were on a, a Zoom meeting. There's one photo that I have of Tyler in this crowd when he moved from the crowd up to the spot on the steps. Before that, when he was in the crowd, that I have a photo of someone else in the crowd and there's a flag over Tyler's face as if I wasn't even supposed to capture him in the first place. So you can see the rest of him. He had his camera out. You can see his entire body. You just couldn't see his, his the, the flank of his face. And that's one of the only images that I think that's unobs that's relatively even unobscured of him. It's, it's also serendipitous and extremely strange. Yeah, I, I think we've all been struck by just the... Um you know, coincidence, whatever you want to call it, but I kind of the sheer impossibility that 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 would be the case, right? That you guys are around each other and in the same circles and um, literally photographing across each other. And um, yet there's there was no crossing of paths. And even like you said, the one the one that he should have been there, it's clearly him. You can see his tattoos. Um, yep. It's still uh, by chance he, he's not there. So it's it's so interesting to us how um, while we wish that you would have crossed paths, because I know uh, Tyler would have absolutely adored you, uh, and I think vice versa, um, we're we're so glad that that you've been able to to come into our lives now, and just like I said, the gift that you offer. Um, the next series of photos, if we want to move ahead, um, we've kind of loosely called this um, uh, really joy and hope for the future. And so I think as you look at these kind of next series, um, we'll start to um, pass through them, but. There's so much, I think, beauty and hope and, again, just joy and dignity in, in what Tyler was able to capture here. I think that is one thing that has struck us um, in the aftermath of Tyler being killed is just all these stories of Tyler speaking up for the underdog, of Tyler taking time to notice people, taking time to hear their story and understand who they were and where they came from. And I think you can see that in the way that he photographed um, the events of, of the summer. He was there to capture the joy and the hope and the positivity um, in the future. And I think that's certainly reflected in the images here. 
Yeah, I remember Britt, uh, us always talking and joking with him, with us having, with him having two older sisters and a mom and being raised in a house full of estrogen that he would be such a soft and sweet and nurturing man and what a lovely husband he would be and a great dad. And you can just, I feel like that illuminates who he was, like the, the soft side of him and the hope and the joy um, just, I mean, it radiated through his, his images. So I think he, he captured it. Yep. So yes, I think there's just a couple more here that you can see the energy, you can see the life um, of these days. And again, just the hope um, that was there. Uh, the next series um, of events uh, is, is kind of, we started with, we, with one that we know is uh, one of his favorites, this next image. Um, this was one of his favorite images. So he actually took this and compared it to a, an image of protests from the 60s um, and talked about how, you know, you, you could mirror these images side by side of, of individuals continuing to fight and raise their voice in protest and um, that there was still so much work to be done, that here we were 50, 60 years later and there is still so much that needs to be rooted out um, when it comes to systemic racism. Uh, and so we chose this one along with the No Justice, No Peace. And the next series of photographs really showcase the marches and the activism and the power and the energy um, that came during these times that he was able to capture. And uh, John, I know you spoke about it, but it's very clear that he intentionally captured um, iconic imagery as well. So the old spaghetti factory and in a future one, you'll see a bourbon bottle. Um, a lot of his images capture street signs. It's, it's like he knew the importance of this moment mm -hmm. um, and that it wasn't just a moment, that it was a movement. And he wanted to make sure to capture in detail um, the various aspects that would allow people to know exactly when this was and where this was and this moment in history um, that we believe will prove uh, to be one that is written in history books in the years to come. And so um, before, we, before we move to the last image, um, we have just one more image to, sh to share with you. And um, this actually um, is the last image that Tyler took. Um, so this was on his camera um, that was returned to us. And we are so grateful um, that that camera was returned to us. Um, he was only able to capture one image on this night um, on Saturday, June 27th. And you'll notice the timestamp um, that it was at 8.09 p.m. And um, for those of you who maybe were not there, uh, the shooting happened just before nine o'clock. And so Tyler um, was gone within 60 minutes of this photograph being taken. And this last image um, that just has so much joy, sorry, go back, uh, that just has so much joy and excitement and um, we actually got to talk to this individual and um, just what a great relationship that they were able to strike up um, in a matter of moments. And uh, Tyler had committed to taking photos for him. Uh, he's a local rapper and uh, Tyler had committed to taking more photos, more headshots for him, but he was able to capture um, just a couple this night. Um, but it, it's so interesting to us that we know in his final moments that he was doing exactly what he loved to do and that he was continuing to see the beauty and the dignity and the worth of the people down there and bringing that to life um, through these images. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I expressed a lot of interest in this image whenever I finally saw it. This is, this is probably one of the most recent images that I saw. It might've taken us a while to I, I can't remember exactly why it took so long for this one to come out to, you know, the, the, the more public eye, at least between the three of us. And I saw this and I saw such a, I, almost like the end of a chapter, um, just the quality of the image overall seems to be a little bit different. Is I, I noticed that from the images that I've seen, Tyler doesn't have a whole lot of people smiling directly at the camera. So for him to take the time to focus on someone for a portrait, uh, it shows like a shift or some kind of change um, in him to me. And, you know, unfortunately he was, you know, killed in that same hour. So.
So I want to transition a bit. That image is absolutely gorgeous. Um, thank you so much for sharing it. And I want to kind of turn to meaning making, which is a huge part of processing grief and dealing with loss. And Brittany, I'm going to start with you with this question. How has Building Equal Bridges developed out of the loss of Tyler? And how are you all working together to support creatives in Louisville and beyond? Yeah, so I think very early on, our family wanted to find purpose and wanted to find meaning and, and was seeking a way to move forward and to, prov to promote healing in, in the city and to promote healing for ourselves and for our family. And, um, and to really find a way to uh, find purpose and meaning into everything that had happened and to carry on Tyler's life and legacy. Um, we actually all were uh, quite taken with uh, Hamilton, uh, the soundtrack Hamilton. And we, um, if anybody remembers, it came out on Disney Plus on July 3rd last year, which was Tyler's birthday. And we had uh, plans to watch it together um, as a family. And there's a, there's a line in Hamilton that talks about your legacy and who lives, who dies, who tells your story, and that it is those around you that are tasked with carrying on your story and telling your story. And that is truly what we believe our purpose is um, as a result of this. And um, we are just so blessed to have John be part of that telling of the story alongside of us because he brings such um, a unique perspective and, and such a, um, he, he completes kind of that, that story of, of what Tyler was likely feeling and experiencing in these, in these last few weeks. And um, so that's truly where it comes from is this idea that we want to carry on Tyler's story. We want to carry on his legacy and we want to continue um, to tell the story of the man that he is and what he stood for, um, which was for uh, justice and change and unity and equity for the next generation. Um, and so that is why the foundation has been established to, to carry on um, those qualities and to continue to promote that good work, both in the city of Louisville as well as beyond. And so um, we, we have three tenets of our, of our organization. Um, it is education, uh, scholarship, collaboration, community partnership, and giving. And um, so we, want, we seek to work with existing organizations that are doing great work and um, look to continue to elevate and um, financially invest in the work that's being done across the city that aligns with, again, Tyler's values and who he is. Um, and so we're, we're, we're so blessed to be able to find that purpose and utilize that um, as a platform to both talk about Tyler and also continue to do good um, in the same way that he was so passionate about it. Um, we've talked about it in various formats, but Tyler was a big brother. Tyler ran in races to raise money for charities. He, um, he oftentimes would purchase things and just give them away to both friends as well as strangers. And um, so it's been really cool just to see uh, more of his character and try to emulate that through the foundation. And before we move on to the Q&A portion, I just, I wanna actually thank a few people because it wasn't possible for me to be connected to you all without the important work of Toya Northington and the Louisville Steering Committee that connected me to John Cherry. And then Stephen Riley, who connected me to Brittany and Tiffany. So I just wanna thank those people because it wouldn't have been possible for us to all work together without their important work. Um, and we can move into Q&A unless you all want to add anything else regarding building bridges. No, I, I would just echo that thanks to, um, to especially those that you mentioned and, and the entire community as a whole, um, just the support that we have felt um, has been remarkable. And, and we are um, so grateful to be part of this community. Um, and Louisville was a city that uh, all of us were born and raised in and was very near and dear to Tyler's heart. And so we're just so grateful for the support of um, obviously our family and our friends, but just um, perhaps even more impactful, just complete strangers who have um, who come alongside of us and supported us in such big ways. So we're, we're very, very grateful. 
Yeah, and I would like to extend a, uh, you know, just a gift of gratitude to both Brittany and Tiffany uh, and your entire family for, you know, even in all of your pain and your hurt for trying to seek healing through our friendship, through our relationship, and for trusting me so much with Tyler's work and my opinions on his work um, and my analysis uh, just overall. Like that's, that's, that's a very, it puts me in a very unique position to befriend someone that I never had the opportunity or the pleasure to meet. And I think that you all do a fantastic job of telling his story for him uh, now that he positioned that he can't. And I definitely do feel him with us whenever we, whenever we speak. I don't, I don't, I can't really describe that feeling, but it is just to give you all a little bit of solace in that loss as well that I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm honored to know you and uh, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Toya, for giving us all this opportunity to speak out loud for everyone else today as well. Mm. So a few questions. The first one is from Catherine Higgins. She'd like to know where, where will these photos reside? That's a great question. Um, and if you want, you can um, share that final slide um, there, Karen. That actually was a photo that Tyler took uh, while we're doing the Q&A if you want to. Um, that was a, uh, it's a compilation of some of his other work uh, beyond just, uh, beyond the, the protest work, which I think kind of captures the diversity um, of, of his portfolio. But um, so great question around where these uh, images will reside. Um, we do have plans for them to be featured in an exhibit um, coming up and uh, uh, we'll be announcing more of that soon. I'm not sure if we can um, share uh, beyond that. Uh, we were so grateful and so honored to have uh, his image featured in Promise Witness Remember um, and just the incredible exhibit that that was and just the amazing work that Allison did in curating that along with the steering team um, and the entire family of Rihanna Taylor. Um, just what an honor that was um, for Tyler's work to be included there. But we will have another exhibit um, in the future. And then we are looking to actually uh, sell his prints and um, utilize them as a fundraising opportunity for the foundation. Um, and so stay tuned. Um, please continue to check out. We've got it down below, but it's tylergerth.com or buildingequalbridges.com is where you'll be able to see um, up-to-date information on that, as well as on social media. We're at Building Equal Bridges um, on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, so please uh, follow us and we will get you more information as soon as we can on being able to see and experience more of Tyler's work, um, both in an exhibit public fashion, as well as uh, for your own enjoyment in your own home, if you're interested in that. So another question is, what camera did Tyler use? John, do you want to take that one? I think it was a Nikon D810E. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was a, a Nikon D800. D800. Yeah. And Close. then his earlier shots with a Nikon D5100. Uh, And we're, um, if someone's asked 35 millimeter film, what, like what media, I think he did, he shot a lot of digital, right, John? Or was he using film? Everything that I've seen is digital, unless all ladies, digital. if you all know, yeah, did he do anything yeah, all digital. digital film before? Yep. There's a question of how he became interested in photography. Um, yeah, so he actually became interested in photography, um, I think right out of high school, he really got into it. Um, he actually purchased his first camera um, from Murphy's camera. Um, and he was so excited. He went in, uh, I remember taking him, he went to UK with me and I remember taking him to Murphy's to get his camera worked on. And uh, he took a photography class a couple of times. Um, but he just loved going out in nature. He was a very outdoorsy type person. Um, and so he just wanted to capture things. Um, he did not like taking pictures of people. Um, I would ask him multiple times to take pictures of our family. And he was like, no, I just can't. So he loved the outdoors. Um, but again, it shows how much passion that he had for the protest for him to go out and take images of people. Um, because that was not what he preferred. Um, and so you can tell in these images here, um, how breathtaking his his landscape imagery is and his uh, nature with the 
with a bison there. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. So I have a question actually, and this is, I know the answer to it, but I was really struck by um, John, what, what brought you to really think about uh, working with Brittany and Tiffany and Tyler's archive. But um, could you talk a little bit more about the, would you explain to me was um, photographers in the field kind of caring for each other's work? And could you explain that here for people that are viewing? Yeah, and so in relation to that original story where, um, you know, that, that, that night I got, the, the night that Tyler was killed, I got a, um, a text message and a phone call from my mother. And I imagine that a lot of photographers did that night that were involved with the protests, documenting the protests and people that maybe they were doing news photo or something like that. Uh, but there was probably only one of us that didn't answer. And, um, and that ended up being uh, Tyler. I also did not answer my phone because it was in another room, which really took my mother for a loop, but recognizing how easy it was and how fleeting this life is and how someone who obviously had a very bright future ahead of them was snuffed out so, so quickly um, created that pact between myself and those other photographers that, hey, if anything happens to you, I'll take care of your stuff. If anything happens to me, you take care of my stuff. And we had it as kind of like a three, uh, you know, a trio pact. Um, whenever someone particularly in this field passes away, oftentimes that's the only memories that anyone has. And it's such an intimate act because you'll, you'll see photos that they took when they were alone. You know, looking at some of these photos that Tyler took and while he was doing his landscape, or even that one in the, the middle of him taking a photo of himself, the classic, every photographer's got this photo of them taking a picture of themselves in a mirror in black and white. It's great, I, I love it, I love, I love that photo. That was one of the first photos I ever saw was of my father's exact um, you know, photo. Uh, but he was alone in that moment. And there's something kind of interesting about seeing a person that you love, uh, somebody that you revere in their element and their, in their moment doing what, what exactly what it is that they love because you weren't there. You, you always look whenever, some, whenever you lose someone, you look for them everywhere. Mm -hmm. And fortunately as a photographer, he took the camera with him everywhere and he showed you stuff that uh, that and from a perspective that only he could see and you can I imagine I don't want to speak for Brittany and Tiffany or the rest of your family but I imagine that with photos you feel even more deeply connected to him than if you didn't have access to his archives and for, for me specifically it's a wild strange rare occurrence to feel connected to someone who doesn't exist on this plane of reality anymore that feels like you know, I could reach out and touch them just by looking at their and looking at and appreciating uh, the way that they compose um, and being with them in those alone moments. Yeah, I, I couldn't echo or agree with that anymore. We get to see how Tyler saw the world by viewing his lens. And um, I think you've made the comment so many times, John, and it's, it's, brought us so much comfort that even in the midst of such trauma, such pain, such heartbreak of the protests, uh, that Tyler still saw the beauty and the joy and the dignity and the worth of each and every one of the people that he photographed. And I think it's really evident um, that you can see who he was and how he saw the, the world and, and ultimately the individuals that he captured. Okay, so this question is for Brittany and Tiffany, and it's, it's also, it's from me. Um, if there's one thing that you want people to remember about Tyler or know about Tyler, what would that be? Um, there's so much to him. So um, I think that just his sweet generosity um, and his caring for other people. Um, I mean, there were many times where he would travel all the way to Lexington just to help me move a piece of furniture. I mean, he was selfless when it came to everything. Um, he was willing to do anything and everything for anybody that he cared for and loved um, and anybody that he didn't know, honestly. Um, he was just, he would give the shirt off his back to anybody that he saw. Um, and I, so I think that's, that's the most important thing that I want people to know is that he was a kind, nurturing, sweet baby um, to us. And that's who he was. That's who he illuminated himself to the world. Um, 
And so he will be missed greatly. Yeah, I, I definitely echo that sentiment. I think for me, people ask a lot of what, um, you know, what do you think Tyler would say about what you're doing or what do you think Tyler would think? And uh, I honestly think he would be laughing at us because this is never anything that he would have asked for. He was intentionally behind the camera, right? We, we don't have a ton of photos of him because he didn't want to be in the spotlight. And um, this is never something that I think he would have envisioned for the way um, his life would turn out. Um, the last text message that I sent to him was um, that I know God has big plans for your life and I can't wait to see the way that that unfolds. And so for that to be the last thing that, that we talked about was just his legacy and, and what he was creating, I think is so interesting that I know um, was at the top of his mind with all the soul searching work that he was doing. Um, but at the same time, he would tell you he was nothing special, right? You, uh, and I said this during his eulogy, but you wouldn't have noticed Tyler. Uh, it doesn't surprise me uh, that John doesn't remember uh, interacting with Tyler if, if he even did, because you wouldn't have noticed him. Um, he was just a regular guy who was showing up every day doing the very best he could with what was in front of him. And I think that's that's my takeaway is that each and every day we wake up and we have the choice uh, to, to behave in the way that, uh, that we see best. And we don't know what day is going to be our last. We are not promised tomorrow. And so my takeaway and, and my challenge to everybody is to live, live each day like it's your last. Know that the, the actions and the behaviors and the attitudes that you exhibit can make a huge impact on those around you. And you don't know the legacy that you might be creating unknowingly, because I can assure you, Tyler would have never dreamed that this would be the legacy um, that is going to exist for him. And so I think it's a challenge to all of us. Um, Tyler lived by the motto, be excellent to each other. That was in his Instagram. And I think um, it's very clear that he lived that out on a daily basis. And so that is our challenge to everyone is to choose to be excellent to one another. Very well said. Yeah, I would say that sounds like a wonderful place to end tonight. Thank you, Brittany, Tiffany, and John so much for this dialogue. And thank you to the Speed Museum for creating this platform.